Welcome to the programme and welcome to my little country retreat. Floor fields here in the heart of Northamptonshire. This is the hostess, that's Lady Catherine Morton. I have to mind my P's and Q's with her. I end up always saying sorry and apologising. Never mind. Hello Lady Catherine, nice to see you. It is a great retreat. It's just down the road from Silverstone. Drivers drop in here, the press drop in here. It's wonderful. But we have got a wonderful programme for you tonight. News, views, the best of, the full ITV treatment. <laughs> Silverstone is one of the highlights of the season, a race with proud tradition and the one they all want to win. Tonight we'll be taking a look back at some of the highlights from recent British Grand Prix. Lapping it up on and off the track, we meet Britain's new Formula One star Jensen Button and hear what he has to say ahead of his home debut. Rolling back the years, Jack Villeneuve recreates some classic movie moments. There's world champion Mika Hakkinen as you've never seen him, taking to skates for a spot of ice hockey no less. And the cat is back. As Jaguar enters Grand Prix racing, we've a look behind the scenes at Formula One's newest team. All that and a whole lot more in the programme tonight. The Jaguar documentary will be a little bit later on. Talking of Jaguars, Here's the big cat, and here's the man that actually tames the beast, three times Grand Prix winner, Johnny Herbert. Welcome to the show, Johnny. Thanks very much for joining us. No problem. The weather could be very, very mixed for the British Grand Prix. This should suit you down to the ground. It could be European Grand Prix all over again. Well, that is one thing that comes to mind. But the, the other thing is we tested last week for four days and had three days of wet weather tested, and I was happy with the setup I got because in the dry we had an engine problem and I never actually got out so so I'm looking forward to a wet wet weekend. Let's put paid to all these rumours well you must be fed up with them they're saying right Johnny Herbert's going to be replaced after the British Grand Prix. Yeah. You've spoken to the team what did they say? Well it was mainly Neil Rest that came up to me in Imola where it basically all started for a magazine auto sprint in Italy uh, and then all the journalists started going up to Neil and asking him and then he got me to one side and said well if all the journalists keep coming up to me and asking and he said well there's, there's that absolutely no truth in it whatsoever so we're, we're all behind you we know the problems that's uh, that's been going on um, and everything's okay so so as far as you know having Neil come up to me like that is uh, is very reassuring he's actually apologized publicly to you and Eddie Irvine for the poor performance of the Jaguars thus far uh, are things improving well they are again we had a lot of problems off season with it with especially the engine and that's sort of something that uh, probably taken a bit too long and then we had other problems in uh, and the engine problem in Australia, especially on my car, where I didn't get any laps together at all. Uh, and then we had a few other little problems in testing again before we went to Brazil. Um, and it's, there's things that are still happening. Last week we had, I said, there was one dry day, so it was the only opportunity for, for everybody to have a go. And I had an engine problem on the first run, or after the first run, and I didn't get back out until 3.30. So basically I lost, lost a dry day's testing, which is why I say I hope it's wet. But after Imola, you must be slightly more encouraged. A tenth place and a seventh place for you and Eddie. Yeah, well, it was it was good that we got the car home for the first time, and both of us got the car home. So the reliability has obviously improved a lot. But we've lost so much time in developing the engine as well, because obviously they've been trying to cure the the, the old problem, uh, and the team has obviously been helping do the same thing. Plus, we've had a few other issues that have come into it, and uh, it's, it's going the right direction. But it's just a shame it's this far down in the season. Tell us about the new stance that you took this season, because you said with all the pressure, I've got to take a different stance. No more Joker, etc. Is it? Uh, well, I think it, it is really, but it's just unfortunate that I keep having other problems uh, with the reliability side, which has sort of hampered me trying to, to, to get the setup that, on my car. But uh, otherwise, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction. And the thing is, once we get the reliability 100%, then we can really start getting, you know, to work on the car and, and developing the engine. Well, now you're one of. Uh a couple of British drivers recently that have won the British Grand Prix and if you said there's one race that you'd want to win to British drivers say it's got to be the British Grand Prix that's what DC said yeah now you've done it you did it in 95 how good did that feel well it was it was amazing really because you know you especially here the, the best thing for me what, what, what my memories of it is actually coming from Val into club and you get like a big panoramic view 
of all the people on the bank all the way around and they're just they're fantastic all the way around the track but that's where you see it the most and you see the flags going the hands going and it's 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 just such a brilliant feeling that it's happening in the british grand prix and if you're winning the race then it's just such a very you know a very very big sensation of uh, you know finally i've done it Thank you for the moment, Johnny Herbert. So there we are. Proud moment for Johnny Herbert, 1995 in the British Grand Prix and his win. We're going to see that now, together with other tremendous memories in the last five years of the British Grand Prix. It always produces patriotic fervour and sometimes it causes a few problems for a few drivers. <laughs> points. I won something to be honest I only got a point but it's stupid isn't it I just feel I felt so emotional about it and everyone was waving and cheering it's terrific
time we've won at Silverstone. Is that important or is it just like any other victory? Mm, no, Silverstone obviously has a huge history and it's one of the nicer races to win, especially after you haven't done it for a long time. Um, yeah, it's satisfactory. We have a lot of supporters here in England and the team uh, hasn't done it for many years here too. So all together it's very nice. attacking and lost his left rear. I was looking desperately for the checkered flags, you know, just to confirm that it was the last lap. You know, this is definitely the best moment in my racing career. emotional moment there for David Coulthard. Now, I wonder if any of the other British drivers are going to hear the national anthem. Schumacher, can he do it again this weekend? And what about that boy Jensen Button? What can he do making his debut here in his very first British Grand Prix? I caught up with him this week and we'll be hearing what he was up to and what he's hoping for this very weekend. And we'll be taking a look at how the season's shaping up so far with the very best of action from Melbourne, Sao Paulo and Imola. That's coming right up. Hello again. Now, the British Grand Prix has moved from its traditional July date to an Easter date. That's one of the reasons why we've come inside the house here. A little bit of music, the fire's going. Certainly uh, tomorrow during the race we could have wind, we could have sleet, snow, who knows. Conditions though will be very different from those of in the first three races of the season. So let's remind ourselves what happened by going first of all across to Melbourne. One, two... Three, four, five, action in Australia! It's a third miracle of miracles. Martin Brundle gets out of the car.
look, they've got a refueling problem. Look, the refuel has not gone on yet. Disaster stop for the Jordan team. Hear this! Jensen Button is in fourth position. Incredible! As oh, out of no. the race goes Jensen Button. I have to say, a very, very impressive uh, debut. The flags are flying and Michael Schumacher is coming through to win for the first time the Australian Grand Prix in wonderful style. A great sight, Schumacher wins. Well done Michael, well done Ferrari. How disappointed are you not to finish? Um, I'm not really disappointed. Uh, it's my first race in Formula One and starting from 21st isn't uh, <laughs> the way that I wanted to start, but uh, there you go. But uh, during the race, I had a couple of good races with Alex Wirtz and uh, also also uh, with Fisichella. So it's uh, it's been a good race for me and to come from 21st up to 6th position, uh, I'm very happy with it. Brazilian Grand Prix is go. Nice one, Hakkinen. Schumacher gets ahead of Kulbar. Schumacher attacking in the first corner, and Barrichello is still behind David Kulbar and Eddie Irvine. He's up into fifth position. in the Ferrari team. Goulbard, miles off the pace for some reason. Is that a Lacey? That's a Lacey, now out of the race, what a shame. Barrichello is going for Hakkinen. Is he, and he's through! Off, spins, Eddie Irvine. Oh dear. And loses his right front wheel. And a puff of smoke from the back of the Ferrari there. Rubens Barrichello slowing down. And it looks as though he's out of the race. He is out of the race. And that's Problem. slowing right down. Slowing right down. I think they have slowing down to do, Murray. He's got a problem. I suspect he'll swing that straight in the big yeah. garage. And he does. I think Kulka's got a gearbox problem. He's not changing gear where you'd expect him to. He should have made at least two shifts up that hill already. And now finally, Fisichella brings the Benetton in for what will not be a lot of fuel to take him to the end of the race. This, if Schumacher finishes this race, is going to be a monumentally crushing victory. This is Jensen Mutt diving through. Look at that, that's Jensen Mutt taking Jos Verstappen. Michael Schumacher wins in Brazil. Two races, two wins. 20 World Championship points.
And that is a real strike for Ferrari. Heitel Frentzen in the pits. Vicka Hekkinen leads. Look at that gap. Look at it now. Jensen Button out of the race. Coulthard needs to pass that Ferrari, otherwise his afternoon is wrecked. Yes, yes. here's Hakkinen. Michael Schumacher also stopping at the same time. A straight race between the mechanic. James. He's put more fuel in for the second stint, so it's be very interesting. Neil Merv and Ralph Schumacher there. I was just thinking, uh, if he was an Englishman, he'd be called Jack Newtown, wouldn't he? I don't know if they'd have named the chicane after him. That's an interesting fact. Barrichello's in, and so is Coulthard. Who's going to get away first? The Ferrari should be easily away first. And it is... Oh, that is so oh. well done. Amazing stop there from the McLaren boys. And look how close now Michael Schumacher is to Mika Hakkinen. Did Hakkinen make a mistake or has he got a little drama? That's Ralph Schumacher retiring from the race. Where the race is going to be won and lost. Six two, he's going to do it by about a second, Murray. Sensational! There is Michael Schumacher exiting the pit lane. Where is Mika Hakkinen? There he is in the background. You're watching a battle royal between two supreme sportsmen who are absolutely on top of their cars and on top of their sport. Absolutely thrilling stuff. And Michael Schumacher wins the San Marino Grand Prix by 1.1 seconds. What a sensational race this has been. Three out of three for Michael Schumacher. He's looking unbeatable at the moment. But there's one man out there reckons he will be able to challenge him in the future. He's young, he's British, he's good looking. His name is Jensen Button and he's very quickly adapting to life in the fast lane. He has just three races under his belt but already the Jensen Button merchandise machine is up and running. A brand new helmet design and the launch of the Jensen Button collection on the eve of the British Grand Prix, where the fans will be looking at him as the new hero after Damon Hill's departure. It's, it's going to be a lot of help with the crowd there. Uh, it's strange because I haven't experienced it yet. It's difficult to know what, what's, what it's going to be like, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it as well. I, I enjoyed racing around Silverstone very much and hopefully uh, we'll get a good result, but uh, you never know in F1. And, this year has been a, a good year for me and I think uh, I needed to, to launch my own clothing range um, collection and also my own logo, uh, which wish we could have done it a bit earlier in the year but we didn't really have that much time but uh, it's good to, good to get it organised and have it in such a good place as, as home. I think there was huge pressure on you when you got back from Australia in terms of the messages of support and this is just a natural progression really isn't it? Oh definitely, it's, it's, uh, it was good when I got back from Australia, Brazil and, and Imola even. So. Uh, it's, it's good for the fans to be involved really, um, to wear the clothing and, and hopefully we'll see some at Silverstone. Now a slightly different uh, logo on the helmet or design on the helmet but we've still got the good old Union Jack in there. Yeah the Union Jack's still on the back uh, and it's sort of on the side but uh, my initials are actually in, in the design now, JB uh, on one side. So. Uh, it's a little different, but you can't really notice that much. Looking forward to Silverstone? Can't wait. It's going to be a, an intense weekend. It's going to be very busy, but uh, no, I'm really looking forward to, to my home Grand Prix. And uh, I should think it's going to be good with all the crowds there. Hopefully, we'll have nice weather. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see. Right, if Button Mania breaks out, as we expected to, uh, what are you going to do? Duck out? No, definitely not. I've got a got to sign autographs and everything it's, it's part of my job and I enjoy doing it it's good it's good that the people are interested in what I'm doing and just being a part of it really it's, it's really good
Well, a phenomenal start for you, the youngest ever British driver uh, to score, or the driver in the world to, to score a, a world championship point. So you've made history there. But I think Imola was slightly tougher than you thought. Those curbs perhaps were like big mountains at some stages of the, uh, of the weekend. I, it wasn't the best weekend, I must admit. The qualifying 18th wasn't where I really, really wanted to be in qualifying. But uh, I didn't really get to grips with the circuit. I knew that it was very difficult, Gerhardt explained to me. Uh, it's when he took me around the circuit it's, it's very difficult to learn and you have to use all the curbs you have to fight with the car quite a bit which uh, I hadn't experienced before in a Formula 1 car so it, it took a bit of time um, and it was a bit too late for qualifying but the warm up went a lot better um, but again it would have been nice to get some more laps in the race I think that would have uh, completed the practice of the circuit really and hopefully I would have been up to the level I should have been but uh, that didn't happen Gerhardt been not just enormous support, but enormous help. He has driven you around some of these circuits and pointed out these bits. Does, does that actually affect your driving when you finally get in there on a new circuit? Uh, c certain things do. It's it's always difficult because everybody drives different, um, uses different lines. But uh, no, it definitely helped around in Miller um, and also the other two circuits in Brazil. Uh, but again, you, everyone drives differently, and when you get on the circuit, it's a completely different things. So. It's, help, it's helpful for him to be there, um, it's just you need to do, try and do your own thing, I think. Now, we've talked about your heroes before, and you've talked about Michael Schumacher, but you're now there racing against him. Watch something in Brazil after the race, when you're in the weigh-in station, like the jockeys after the event, and you extended your hand to, to shake his, and he gave you a quick handshake and looked the other way. Now, that, to me, said everything, that this guy... Jensen Button is a serious competitor of mine, so I'll give him the sort of hard case stare and look the other way. How is he towards you? He's fine. We've uh, we've met a couple of times, um, obviously on the briefings and the driver parades, and all the Formula One drivers have been very talkative and uh, saying how is it going, and, and especially after him as well after my bad qualifying, everyone was taking the mick out of me. But uh, no, it's uh, they've been good. But you've also been very honest, uh, which is disarming for some journalists. Said, well, look, I'm having a bad time, guys. Uh, you have to, I think, and you've got to you've got to stay relaxed when you're driving, and you've, you've you can't lie about what's been ha going on, really, um, because they're always going to pick up the truth in the end. So there's no real use. Well, even the monosyllabic Eddie Irvine has come out and said that boy's got it. He's okay. And uh, is that a good endorsement for you from the Irv? Definitely. He's, uh, I've I've met him a couple of times and uh, had a few long conversations with him, and now we get on quite well. And um, no, it's good. F it's nice for him to say something like that. It's always very very nice when one of your competitors says something good about you, especially from Eddie as well. Jensen Button, definitely a future world champion, for me anyway. In a moment we're going to be talking to a driver from a very different era of motor racing. So Sterling Moss is still a regular visitor on the Grand Prix circuit. He's here again this weekend and he's been talking to Murray Walker about more than half a century in motorsport and a couple of other living legends, not quite as old. We join Martin Brundle and Damon Hill for a few tips on how to tackle a lap of Silverstone. That's coming up. Absolutely right, because one inch offline and you're going to have difficulty in the exit. A moment ago we heard from young Jensen Button and now it's time to hear from two veterans of the sport, Sir Sterling Moss and Murray Walker. They've both been involved for over 50 years in motor racing. They're as enthusiastic as ever, certainly when they talk about it. Sterling, as two of the more mature chaps here, yeah. you, you and I go back to 1948 when it wasn't even the British Grand Prix, it was the RAC Grand Prix. 1949 was yeah. the first British yeah. Grand Prix at Silverstone. What do you remember about that? I remember the. I remember Silverstone at that time. Of course, was a real airport. I mean, uh, or had just been an airport, and we used to race towards each other and then zoom off because we were using the runways. Uh, I was driving a 500 cc car in those days, so everything seemed so big and so wide. I mean, it was an enormously wide track for us. Yeah, and the, and the whole thing was was very different then. We've all got used to motor racing then, but. We'd just come out of a war and we were getting back into motorsport and the whole thing was tremendously exciting and glamorous. Very amateur. I mean, really amateur. I mean, I can't tell you. With, with the car that I had, we, brought, we arrived with that in the, in the back of a horse box. 
really? took the sins of divide out. Oh, yes, because yeah. my, my sister used to ride horses, and Dad said I could use the horse box and take the cinder out. And, I mean, we really were. My mother and father and I had a German pr a prisoner of war who had been, and uh, he was a mechanic and helped with the mechanicking. And so, I mean, the whole thing was, was very... And even, even the Formula One guys were very, very amateur compared with today. Now, you've, you've, you've raced for Mercedes-Benz, you've raced for Van Moor, you've raced Maseratis. Do you think Grand Prix racing these days is better, worse, or just different? Different. I think it's. I think it is far more sophisticated. I think what they achieve with these cars is remarkable. I think the sporting side of it has gone, which I think is a great loss. I don't think it's spoiled. It hasn't spoiled the racing, but it has. It's spoiled being part of it. I mean, it, when I was racing, it was it was really gr fantastic fun to be in there taking part. But I don't think today it's quite like that. I you think, think you make up with a bank balance. Do you think it's too professional? No, I, I think I think the trouble. I don't think it's too professional, and I think the, because it's so professional, I think it, it is it is it is spoiling it. Yes, I do, but I don't think it's because it, because it's so well done. I think it is extremely well done now. I mean, everything runs on time. We have practice times. We know exactly where we are, and I think the cars are remarkable. The achievement. I think the drivers do a fantastic job, but I don't think because of the technology that it allows us to see the drivers at their best. Because a driver only has to at Silverstone how long. How much time has he got to pass? Nothing. Mm -hmm. This is why they can't pass very much. Mm -hmm. But that's because the technology is so good. It isn't because racing is bad. It's because they've made the cars so good, in the same way as they have aircraft and so on, that, that it just doesn't give them the opportunity of demonstrating, as a man like Fangio could, his skill. Now, what about safety? Because, sadly, in your days, it was by no means unusual for two, three, four drivers a year to be killed, and, and thank heavens, touch wood, that just doesn't happen now. Safety has improved beyond recognition. But there are yeah. some people who think it's too safe. Well, I'm one of those, I'm afraid. I, th I think that an important ingredient as a driver, an important ingredient is the danger, because uh, if, you're, if you're going round a corner at 120 miles an hour and you manage to leave another man behind a yard or two, the feeling of exhilaration is enormous. If there was no danger at all, if you've got a safety net to catch you, I think that would be lessened. I think it's rather like salt in cooking. You need a bit of danger. I think the other problem, and it's much bigger than that, I think that because of the safety of the cars, now we're getting a contempt of danger, and therefore the driving, not the standards of driving, but the quality of... of ethics, if you like, is lessened. I mean, when you look at it, you can see that some of the best drivers in the world will push another driver off the road to 150. Mm. But that is because he doesn't think of danger. You wouldn't do that in, 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 in my day. You wouldn't dare. True. No. But I, and one thing, though, Mario, I do think that if the guys of today were racing when we were racing, I'm sure they were, would be just as ethical yes. as they were, yes. because yes. times have changed. Yeah. Now, I, I was going to say, you, you used to race against legendary names like Ascari and, and, the, and the great Fangio, who was a teammate of yours. How, how do you rate them now with the Coulthards, the Hekkinens, the Schumachers, the Nigel Mansells well. of this world? In my I mean, mind, I mean, in my mind, quite honestly, the, in each era you get a man who's outstanding. I mean, to me, Fangio was the greatest. I think probably the greatest that's ever lived mm. as a yeah. complete driver. I think Senna probably approached him in, in skill. I really do. Ethically, no. But then it wasn't required in his time. You can't, you can't say the man wasn't as nice as Fangio was because, it, because it's a different life. And I think today, I think you've got Michael Schumacher, who I personally believe is in a class of his own. And, and I don't think that, that I think that we've got to wait till another one comes along. Well, you may, you may have answered my question, next question, because I was going to say, uh, let, let's look ahead to this year's race. Uh, from what you've just said, you think that Schumacher will win in a canter? It depends on the weather, it depends on many things. I mean, if, if this race is wet, then I think it, it, it is an advantage to him because I think he has an enormous skill. But then having said that, I mean, people like David Coulthard are, are, are still, there are no slouches in it. And racing in the wet is a very, very difficult thing. I think the, the, the thing you have to understand, when you're racing in the wet, you, you lose your adhesion. Mm -hmm. The adhesion drops. When the adhesion drops, you have to be more careful with the car. You have to massage it into cord. You don't go in and tweak it over like this and then give it some stick. 
You just you can't do that. It all has to be done very smoothly and very carefully. You have to the car's saying something to you. You have to be able to interpret what it's telling you, and you do it but very carefully. So I, I think if even, even if it's wet, I think it'll be an interesting race. Any any regrets in your mind about Sterling Moss and the British Grand Prix? You won it twice. You had a second place in 1959. Do you look back and think? Uh, if only the giggle pin hadn't broken in 1960 or whatever it was. Well, no, I don't think one can do that. I think, frankly, the thing about motor racing, you never win with, it's never good luck to win. It, it is, what you don't want is bad luck, breaking something. I've had bad luck, but uh, overall, I think the British Grand Prix has been pretty good to me, and, and I, I've enjoyed it. And that's what, what, for me, motor racing was all about. And you've certainly been pretty good to the British Grand Prix, Sterling. Thank you very much. Thank you. So from one set of veterans to another set of semi-veterans, certainly a little bit grey around the curbs. We're going to join Martin Brundle and the recently retired Damon Hill as they show us how to tame the Silverstone track. We join them as they walk around the hallowed tarmac. Welcome Damon. We're heading towards Cox, the first corner. Now amazingly you're doing about 190 miles an hour right here. What's happening? Well, it's a very difficult uh, corner to actually pick the line through. We're obviously running much lower to the ground than we are when we're walking, and we don't have a clear vision of the entry. It's, it's very blind, and it's, it drops away. There's an um, adverse camber. So once you're committed, you have to commit a very high speed. You have to get it absolutely right, because one inch offline, and you, you're going to have difficulty in the exit. But how much are you actually slowing down? I mean, it's a 90-degree right-hander that's, as you yeah. say, completely out of sight. How much are you slowing down? It looks a lot tighter than it really is. That's the, the unnerving thing about it. Um, but uh, you lose one gear, basically. We're coming sixth gear, nearly top speed in sixth gear. Just get fifth gear, get on the throttle, straight on the throttle and get out of the corner. Uh, you should be full throttle almost, just past the apex. But do you actually touch the brakes? You do, do, lightly you touch the brakes. Or yeah. left foot or with the right no, foot? No, I'm a right foot breaker, so I come off the throttle on the brake and then back on the power almost straight away. But on the exit, it's, it's an incredibly small kerb, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you and I helped redesign this circuit, and I think this corner has ended up being yeah. one of the great corners of the world. It's a hell of a challenge, isn't it? But there's no room for error on the exit, is there? There's not a lot of room. The runoff also reduces on the exit, and that's the place where you're about to lose it. And the entry, they've got lots of runoff, which is good because of the start. Um, and by the way, when you do the start, you sometimes can be all over the place. You know, it can be right up against the wall on the entry to this corner. So um, the view you get at the start is uh, quite, uh, quite different to the one you have when you're uh, running during the race. But the start is much nearer the corner this year, isn't it? Because they've, they've moved the start, whole start grid down the, down the pit straight a little well, bit, so everybody possible, starts in a straight line. Which is good, because it'll make it possible to get past people on the outside if you need yeah. to at the start, which is... Um, which is what you need, you know, a uh, chance to improve your position. Yeah. But all in all, a pretty good corner to start the lap with. Excellent. So we're sitting on the kerb here in the, in the middle of Beckett's. I mean, it looks a bit flat and featureless probably, but for me, Damon, this is one of the most challenging corners in the world, or complexes in the world. Yeah, um, it's, one, it's the one corner, one of the very few corners where you, you as a driver, are always... Um, impressed by a Formula One car. You know, you cannot believe what you can do. And then you sort of, you come in there in the entry at about, uh, well, maximum speed almost in sixth gear. And you about just 175, get, I think it is, isn't it? Give it a lift, just throw it into this section, chuck it from one side to the other, and desperately try and hang on to this curb here that we're sitting on, and stay tight if you can on the exit, because the next bit of it is the most important bit. Yeah. If you get that right and get a good exit, you flat out all the way down to Stowe, yeah, and, and that's you, about half a second. You carry all that extra yeah. kilometres or whatever down, all the way down to Stowe, don't you? But, I mean, it, it, it is it, the total belief you have to have in the car when you turn into this complex is just amazing, isn't it? Yes, I mean, that is, that's part of it. You have to believe it'll stick. Yeah. And there's, at that sort of speed, the cars generate so much downfall, so they will stick. It's just whether you uh, have confidence enough to be able to chuck it around it. And, and you take a bite out of the seat, and it's not with your teeth, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a bit like that. <laughs> but this corner really depends on um, wind direction as well, doesn't it? If you can turn in on a headwind, mm. you've, got, you've got that little bit of extra downforce, and the car will stick. But if it's a crosswind, it scares you to death, doesn't it's it? It's the same everywhere at Silverstone. It's, it's very exposed, um, and the wind will have, a, have an effect on the downforce. If the wind's up your chuff going into this corner, it'll oversteer, and then it makes it quite tricky. So big thumbs up for Beckett's then. 
Right then, DH, club, what's special about it? Well, it's quite technical. It's quite tricky to get the car right. You're, you're trying to come out of a very slow left-hander through a chicane, and you're, you're tempted to go hard on the throttle very early, but you can't because there's not enough grip. So you have to balance the car all the time accelerating around a long, long corner. It's, it goes through a lot of changes. The whole car starts to pick up aerodynamic downforce towards the exit. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a typical corner at Silverstone. It's a, it's a challenging one because it's so technical. So here we are at Bridge. You can occasionally hear the traffic rumbling over the top. You're doing about 155 miles an hour. Come with me and Damon through this corner. Talk us through it, Damon. I mean, it's a great challenge as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic because you come barreling down a hill. Uh, and so you can see the corner, you can see the apex, and you can get it flat out if you want to. But the, the trouble is, the more you push the car through the corner, the more difficulty you have on the exit getting back across for the next corner, which is a left-hander. But it's got a bit of camber, hasn't it? A bit of banking. So, yeah. and, and it's into the hill a little bit. And I think that's why you can just carry more speed to it than you ever imagined possible. Yeah? That's right. The car gets buried here. And so you get a bit of vertical G and a lot of lateral G. And uh, the car really sticks well. Straight into Priory. Now, didn't you have a little um, tiff with uh, Michael Schumacher once in there? Um, well, I'm very sketchy these days on what happened in my career. I don't seem to remember anything about that. Well, he reversed, in, me. He reversed into you, didn't he, that's as you were going in there about 100 coming, miles an hour? Coming back to me now, yeah. And so he left the door open and you had to go through it. And I seem to remember, I don't know, I can't remember all the excuses at the time, but yeah. one of those unfortunate Grand Prix. I don't remember getting a cheer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the, the complex, as it's called, which is made up of Priory, 110 miles an hour, break heavily into Brooklyn. This is where a lot of cars are running wide. It's just 55 on the apex a short squirt into the long long right hander of Luffield look at Damon fighting to get that Jordan into the corner patient on the throttle now accelerate hard into Woodcut up to 155 miles an hour straighten the car up into the pit straight you're looking at a new lap okay we'll take a quick break there but we'll be right back with an expert guide on how to drive a Formula One car Welcome back. Do you remember Martin Brundle's excellent Formula One driving school series last year? Well, many of you did remember it and you've asked to see it again, so we're going to show it to you. Sit back and enjoy Martin Brundle's unique Formula One driving lesson with a difference. Welcome to F1 ITV's Formula One Driving School. I want to put you inside the head of a Grand Prix driver and more inside the cockpit. We've borrowed Damon Hill's Jordan for the day and a great number of his team. You wouldn't believe how many people it takes to run one of these cars. Man on a wheel gun here, ready to put our tyres on for the first run of the day. A laptop computer, you can't start the engine up without one of those. Many people, in case we want to make suspension or wing changes, and finally, an electric starter to turn the engine. It's very much a team effort, but at the final hurdle, it's the driver that has to deliver. But first I've got to get in, which needs a bit of procedure. Step over the high side, both feet in, a bit like getting in the bathtub, and slide down remembering to grab the crutch straps on your way down otherwise you're sitting on top of them and the mechanic can't find them now you just have to wait a bit like a baby while somebody straps you in there's just not enough width or elbow room to move these seat belts and they're so tight to stop you moving around inside the car while you're out on the racetrack you couldn't possibly do them up so there's six of those to go on but I'm already feeling part of this car the seat the pedals the footrest the padding is all designed to fit my body and the few seconds even I've been in here I feel part of it, I feel cosseted, I feel safe, I feel comfortable, the seat belts are done up, the steering wheel is on and everything is set. <laughs> Very narrow, very tight, and now we've got incredible acceleration. 
down now to Beckett. And four gears into second gear. Takes some curve on the inside and control the slide. The steering wheel is very light at high speed. There's not a problem. As soon as I turn it, I get immediate response from the car. Controlling the slide, we're into left field. Slide on the inside of the curb. Be patient. Okay, now I can see the straight ahead of me. Now, if I brake too late, the car wants to sneak around. I need a little bit of rear brake balance. I can barely see the corners. I'm just peeping over the top of the monocoque. You need to be down there for weight distribution, centre of gravity, but it makes it very difficult to see the corners and the curves coming up. You just can't believe the car wants to stick, but it gives you the feedback, it gives you the loading up through the steering wheel, you can immediately feel the grip. And as you go further and further, you feel more and more comfortable in the car. The car becomes part of you. It reacts to whatever you're thinking about and what to do next. You can more or less think the car around the circuit. Very small movements, the smoother you are with the car, the better it handles, the more it gives you back. Well, that was just brilliant to remember the purity of these cars. Squeeze the throttle and you get an instant response surging forwards up to 16 odd thousand revs. Brilliant. Touch the brake pedal and it builds retardation. Really, really powerful. Turn the wheel, you get an immediate response. Exactly what you're looking for. I can see why this car's going so well this year. I'd like another 100 laps straight away, please. Welcome to the grid here at Silverstone. Now the start is often your best chance of overtaking in Formula One and of course of losing places too. Go! Good start by Mika Hakkinen. He's through, he's past Schumacher and Coulthard. Terrible start for the Ferraris. There's over 17,000 brake horsepower waiting here on the grid as the 22 cars line up to depart. It's a technical procedure and as ever, not quite as straightforward as it first seems. I'm coming onto the grid now, down to first gear, take neutral, there's my number on the side of the racetrack, there's where my grid slot is going to be, pull in towards the white box, line the front tyre up with the yellow line. Basically there's three ways of getting these cars off the line. The first one is what I call granny leaving the supermarket, minimum revs, minimum wheel spin and unfortunately a big chance of stalling the engine. Okay, we're waiting patiently on the line. The first red light is on. So I pull, I'm in, I'm in first gear. The lights are building up. I'm gonna put some revs on. Everybody around me is going crazy. And just a tiny bit of wheel spin. Option two, the boy racer. All the revs on the rev limiter, drop the clutch, spin the wheels, 50 quid's worth of rubber on the racetrack. Looks good, feels good, sounds good, but it's not the best way. Finally, the option they all have to take in the end, the control freak approach. Around 10,000 RPM from the engine, drop the clutch, a little bit of wheel spin, blend out the throttle, control that wheel spin, hook the rear tyres up and go. It's the best way in the end. I take first, yes I've got first. Try to put 12,000 revs on. There's the lights, are we ready to go? There's a nice little bit of wheel spin, control the throttle. the right way to do it but it can very easily go wrong it's a very delicate operation into first gear yes I'm happy have I got enough revs on everything's going crazy around me oh no you may say how can these highly paid drivers stall their engine I don't do that 
but it's surprisingly easy to do in a Formula One car. If you do stall the car on the line, you're torn between two options, sticking your hand out of the cockpit to warn the other drivers, or burying your head and waiting for the impact. But there's even more to this starting business than that. There's so many other factors. How hot is the track? How sticky are your tyres? How much downforce are you running? How much fuel have you got in the car? Is it on an uphill slope or a downhill slope, the start line? You just have to get a feel for it to get it right. Now one of the most difficult things to demonstrate to you is the level of energy that's going on inside a Formula One car. It all tends to look very calm and collected from the outside until something goes wrong. It's called G-Force. Now I don't always carry furry dice in my car, you'll be pleased to know. We've put them in to demonstrate what G-Force is. It's the force that will make these dice go over to the left as I take this right-hand corner. And if I brake heavily, they'll go forwards. It's the same force that'll slide your granny from one side of the car to another if you go into a roundabout a little bit too quickly. Here's a good example, Eau Rouge at Spa. A big left right in the bottom of the hill, about 170 miles an hour, then leap off the kerb on the way out. Massive energy going on there. Here we are in my road going Ferrari, which is probably the fastest car on the road. But even in ideal conditions, this car will generate something around 1G of lateral force going through a corner and a Formula One car is four times that because of the downforce created and the very wide slick racing tyres. As I hit the bump on the straight it evacuates my lungs, I can barely breathe over that bump. Left hand corner, my neck immediately tightens to try to hold my head in the position I want so I can balance the car on the throttle. What does that mean in reality? Four times the force of gravity. Your head weighs five kilos, for example. Maybe a Grand Prix driver's head's a little bit bigger. A crash helmet is one and a half kilos, so six and a half kilos times four, 26 kilos. Imagine somebody putting a 26 kilo weight on the side of your head instantaneously. As I break down, your head wants to go forward. Your neck is fighting the weight of your head. Now, under braking, longitudinal G, something around three and a half to four G again in a Formula One car. If you watch, I'm braking heavily now, watch the dice go forward. I've had it on a coolish day where you get little drops of water in the corner of your eye. You break so heavily with such violence in a Formula One car that the drops of water can actually come out of the corner of your eye and splat on the back of your visor. That's some pretty serious stopping power. Worse than that, your internal organs are also subjected to the same forces as our furry dice hair. And they're moving around inside you too and rattling around on your, uh, against your rib cage. And that just soaks up your energy. Here's a good example of those energy levels here at Silverstone in just two corners. Heavy braking into Abbey Chicane around 3.6 G, leaping across the kerbs, a lot of accelerative forces into bridge corner, don't lift the throttle, for lateral G. Let us try and put this into perspective, using the Ferrari as a reference point. Jim Vale, the team manager, is driving that, 0 to 60 in 4.3 seconds, a top speed of 200 miles an hour. I'm going to accelerate the Jordan up to 100 miles an hour and break down to zero long before the Ferrari makes it to 100. Let's look at that one more time. Both cars spinning their wheels off the line. The Formula One car digs in up to 100 miles an hour. Hit the brake pedal now. Under eight seconds. Brutal. Well, we couldn't find anywhere to hang the furry dice in this. But I hope now you've got a much better understanding of the forces at work in a driver's office. More from Martin Brundle later, with or without his personal casino. Certainly you won't see any furry dice in this next item. A great trip back down memory lane. 1966 and all that. James Garner and the movie Grand Prix.
1966 movie Grand Prix inspired a whole generation of Formula One fans. More than 30 years on, its star James Garner is back with BAR's Jacques Villeneuve for a celebratory sequel at Monza, a circuit steeped in history. It's a great racing movie. Uh, it, it really showed uh, the, the level of dangers and risks they were taking. It was one of the most, you know, exhilarating uh, experience of my life. Uh, six months of driving these cars with the best drivers and the best circuits in the world and it was thrilling. It really was. A lot of the scenes were shot at the actual Grand Prix that year and there were no stand-ins. Garner did all his own driving. You'd be surprised how fast you can learn uh, when you have you know, all these race drivers on all these circuits and I, we'd learn them three or four blocks at a time, the circuits, and then Eventually, we'd be able to learn the whole circuit. Can you go? Yeah. So, how would the 97 world champion shape up in a car that was older than him? I didn't feel like there was any point in doing it unless you did it the real way. Uh, we had the belts taken out, so it was more real. In, in today's cars, we're, we are very tight in the car. We don't move an inch. Uh, so to be in a car like that would just move around like in a normal road car and be completely out in the open, it, it, you don't feel that secure. Once you're in there, you just still push a little bit and try to have fun. Uh, and uh, it still felt like a race car. I had a good, uh, the engine wasn't too bad. It was some, there was some, some beef, some power in there. But I wasn't sure what would happen once I got sideways. Um, it happened a few times, but I wasn't going fast enough for it to be scary. I think he's enjoying himself. <laughs> they were taking more risks, but they probably weren't pushing the limit as much because any time you made a mistake, you paid quite dearly for it. So it was just very, very, very different. The banking hasn't been used since 1968, but it's still a monument to Monza's glory days. We would have to do a shot where we'd do six or seven cars. This car had to pass him on the left, you know, at this corner, whatever. And then when we ended the shot, we all turned around and raced back, and that was fun. For the first time since finishing the movie all those years ago, Garner was back at the wheel of a Formula One car, and time stood still. A lot of memories here. I started driving a little while ago, and as I was coming back into the pits, I started giggling. <laughs> Just giggling. It was so much fun. That was good. Like a kid. That's good. Yeah. 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 I had a blast. Uh, it was great. And uh, it's good we didn't do too many laps because uh, you, you get comfortable, then you start pushing, and, and that's probably when you, you start hurting yourself. Uh, but no, I had a, l a very good time. There'll probably never be another movie like Grand Prix. It's still a true classic. Great stuff there, rolling back the years at Monza, but next we're going to get bang up to date with news of new regulations that are being brought into force for Formula One at Silverstone this weekend. As some of you have seen or heard, there are going to be some major rule changes in Formula One at Silverstone this weekend. Essentially, the car is run by a whole series of elaborate electronic gizmos, which the FIA, the governing body of the sport, find very difficult to police. So there's going to be a computer clampdown, a simplification of the computers, and the human element, i.e. the driver, is going to be put first. 
as FIA President Max Mosey explained to Murray Walker. It's really now difficult, if not impossible, to understand exactly what's happening in the electronic brain, or brains, because there are several of them, of these cars. I mean, the computing capacity now on each individual Formula One car is enormous. So what we've really said to the teams is the most important thing for us is to be absolutely sure that we know what's happening, because only if we know what's happening can we give a guarantee to all the teams that everyone is running within the rules and running legally. If it's too complicated, we're very sorry, but you've got to simplify it to the point where we can understand it. We're not prepared to have a, a sort of fog about what's going on. So what we've done in effect is say, you, we're going to go around and cut some of the wires to make things easier and simpler for our people to check so we know what's going on. But if you, the teams, want to help us to make this clearer and easier to understand, we're prepared to be more delicate in what we're doing. So we've started off, as from Silverstone, we're simplifying these things. We hope, and we, in fact we've reason to believe we will, get the cooperation of the teams to take it further. Can you, can you give me a, for instance, what sort of things are going to be wheeled out? Well, for example, at the moment, people are measuring the speed of the engine. This is getting pretty esoteric. Speed of the engine on the crankshaft and the camshaft. Now they are so sophisticated nowadays that by telling the difference between those two measurements of an engine, of course, which is going all the parts which should be going at yeah. the same speed, the, they, by telling the difference of the rate of acceleration of those two parts of the engine, they can tell whether it's accelerating in a way it shouldn't. And from that, the computer can deduce that perhaps it's got wheel spin. And from that, the computer will adjust or can adjust the ignition and or the fuel so as to mitigate the wheel spin and help give the driver practically a form of traction control. One point to make is traction control has always been banned. It's not that it's being banned for this race, it's just the FIA tightening up on it. We obviously have a lot of very complex engine control systems on the car, electronic systems, and the FIA are concerned that they're being used to limit the power put to the rear wheels when the wheels are spinning, which is, would be a form of traction control. So in a lot of areas, they've, they've limited the input of these systems or limited the use of these systems so to ensure that there's no way that you could have any form of traction control while the car's on the circuit. One of the most visible ways for most people to see this is the pit lane speed limiter, which the FIA were concerned that drivers could use out on the track. So um, they wanted to limit the use of that, but then the team suggested a way forward. So when the pit lane speed limit is used by the driver in the pit lane, you'll see the fuel flap open, the rear light flash. So there's a very visible way to identify that the pit lane speed limit is being used. So the FIA can be sure that it's not being used on the track by the drivers. So, and with that and many other systems, they're just making sure that there can be no form of traction control out on the circuit. Uh, there have been suspicions for two or three years that some teams are using some hidden kind of traction control. Uh, why has it taken the FIA as long as it has to get after it and do something? Well, uh, we've been after it and doing something constantly and we're always forever stopping people doing things. But of course we don't tell the other teams. With one team in particular is very suspicious about another top team in Australia. Now we know we've stopped it, but we can't tell the team who are suspicious because it would be breaching confidence. We are totally on top of it. The reason we've taken these rather dramatic steps is that evidence emerged that somebody did something last year that we didn't spot and something really quite serious. And when I heard that, I said to our people, we've got to go a whole order of magnitude harder on this because we must be certain that we are know that we know what's going on major team or a minor team middle ranking yes. no names no pactrum down <laughs> a few changes to keep your eye on at silverstone tomorrow of course the rules don't allow for passengers in formula 1 just yet but who knows how about this Murray Walker on board with co-commentator Martin Brundle. You're sitting there, you don't really know what to expect, and suddenly you get this hammer blow in the back. And 
and I thought, my, my gosh, if, it, if it's like this in the pit lane, what's it going to be like when we actually get on the track? Just going out of the pit lane now and joining the track. Down in the fourth, looking for the left of Beckett, over the kerb a little bit. Turns in nicely and hard on the gas now. Into hangar straight, fifth gear already. I was trying to tell him what was going on and what I was feeling because the car was sliding a lot, especially in the early lap, so I was trying to fill him in on that. Tires are not fully up to temperature yet. And then over the top of the hill into club. When we hit the brakes, uh, he, he would feel the energy. I was going right forward into that bar that's in front of me, notwithstanding the fact that the straps were done up so tightly. Back end sliding. There we go. Yeah. Full speed, full throttle, over the start finish line, sixth gear, up to about 180. So top speed will be in two places, one coming into Cox, the first corner where we'll be just under 190 miles an hour. Pretty much the same speed going into Stowe down at the end of Hangar Straight. We're going to go really, really deep into Stowe, on the brakes, down two gears. Wait on the entry, there we go. Plenty of grip around the outside here. Yes. Up the hill now, sick here already in Drabby. This is the big stop. Knowing the corners, I at least knew which direction to look in. I think you go around bridge at about 150 miles an hour and it feels like it. This is bridge corner. Oh yeah, lots of grip through there now. I'd already said to him, if you don't fancy that last flying lap, and uh, he just shouted out as we're head heading down the pit straight here, I'm okay for the last lap, so it was great, and uh, which uh, then I gave him an extra special lap because he seemed very comfortable about it. Wait for it. Oh, a lot of bit of oversteer there. Nice no, easy flat out. Down the hill, into Club. Oh, there we go, a bit of understeer still there. I would say we were about 95% there uh, on, on the average lap. Obviously, down the straights, I'm giving it everything that, that I've got. And uh, I wanted to give Murray every sensation of speed that we could. And then two hangar straight. Cars running well. Martin was absolutely fabulous. We, we did a lap, he's just told me in about eight or nine seconds off a really hot lap in a single-seater Formula One car. And not for one split second did I feel anything other than totally relaxed and calm and confident in the man that was in front of me. Out of clap corner. Great acceleration. Let's remember, this gentleman's 75 years old, you know, and super impressed that he would even dream of going in it, let alone relish and look forward to the opportunity as he did. Overall, I think it worked out well, and I feel that he's got a, a full sense of what it's like to be in a Formula One gun. I think next time he sees some in-car footage, it will have a whole new meaning for him. Well, I can tell you this, if you ever think that life is dull and ordinary and that things are passing you by, you should try this, because it takes 20 years off your life. It's the most stimulating, exciting, rewarding, dramatic, innovating experience I have ever had in my life. Fabulous. Welcome back. 
Now, as promised, there's more Formula One driving tips from our very own expert, Martin Brundle. If you're a Grand Prix fan, you know that pit stops play a key role in race strategy and track position. Up to 20 men are waiting for you for a regular pit stop here in pit lane. They can win or lose you the race, but the driver plays a key role too. Second gear, cross to cross, a little bit. Bring it to the inside balances in this time, but we must be quick through that pit lane. Pit lane, pit lane incredibly tight but this is part of the race so we've got to get through here as quickly as possible there's the speed line okay i'm heading towards my men at 120 kilometers an hour remember that's faster than michael schumacher when he hit the wall okay I, i'm hitting neutral holding my foot on the brake holding the wheel straight keeping the revs consistent in gear it said and we're away Where's the line? There's the white line and away. Tight corner, full corner, control the slide. Well, I was satisfied with that stop, but it doesn't always work so well. Here's a Jordan and a Williams pitting at the same time for race position. The Williams skidding into the pit lane, but no problem for their mechanics. Now, who's going to get away first? Clearly, it's Ralph Schumacher and the Williams. A slight problem at the back of the Jordan, and track position has been gained. But there can be other problems too. Here's some driver error from David Coulthard arriving too quickly in a slippery pit lane, skidding past the pits. Everybody has to move, the wheelmen, the fuel men. It adds five or six seconds to the stop. This time it's Hakkinen's McLaren. They can't tighten the left rear. This would eventually cost him the British Grand Prix. Let's take another look at that pit stop in the Jordan. Coming in the pit lane now, slowing down, it's incredibly narrow and slippery, being very, very careful through there. Quite a tight chicane. Now I'm looking for the speed limiter line. There it is now, braking hard to make sure I'm not speeding. Now I'm heading for my garage of men. Braking hard, there's a guy with his hand over the right front tire. I know where to park. Tires are coming off, I've hit neutral. I'm watching that lollipop ahead of me. It says brakes on to keep the rear wheels from spinning. I'm holding the steering wheel straight. Now I pull for first gear, the lollipop goes up and I'm confident to pull away. I can't see anything in the mirrors until I'm out in the pit lane, but I trust the man on the lollipop implicitly. Now I've got rid of the speed limiter and I'm regaining speed out onto the racetrack. A quick glance in the mirror to see if anything's coming and I join the racing line now. Calculating the time lost in that pit stop is a simple school equation where E equals the time lost. First of all, A, slowing into the pit lane itself and then regaining speed afterwards is bound to cost you around three seconds. The pit lane must be negotiated at reduced speed. Then the team garage zone is limited to usually 120 kilometers per hour. Time lost, 24 seconds. The pit stop itself for fuel, tires and cleaning of the visor and radiator ducks varies. One stoppers take on more fuel, of course, than two stoppers. Time lost, one stopper, 11.5 seconds. Two stops, 8.5 seconds. Three stops, 6.5 seconds. Whilst it feels as if you're crawling down the pit lane on the limiter, it would still take time to negotiate the normal racetrack from pit entry to pit exit. This time has to be deducted, let's say 12 and a half seconds. So for a two stopper, the total time lost for each pit stop is A plus B plus C minus D. In this case, 23 seconds. In a 60 lap race with two scheduled stops costing a total of 46 seconds, the car must be more than three quarters of a second per lap faster due to reduced average fuel load and fresher tyres to be advantageous. That's relatively easy to achieve, providing there are no problems. It's pressure time for the mechanics. Your life is in their hands. They must get those wheels on properly and, of course, get the fuel on board. As the car heads down the pit lane, they're all thinking, have I done my job properly? Well, that's the theory, and it's very much teamwork, of course. You're sitting in the car, there's so much action going on around you, it's difficult to know exactly what's happening. You feel like the race is passing you by. Eight seconds will never seem longer. Now the balance of a Grand Prix car is absolutely critical. What, what does that mean? It means the front and the rear tyres sliding together in unison, so you're in balance. You'll hear Murray and I always banging on about understeer and oversteer. 
let me explain that to you. Put yourself where I am in the racing car. You want to go around a right-hand corner, you turn the wheel, but the car won't go in enough. The front tyres begin to scrub across the road. It's not steering enough, it's understeering. You have to put more steering angle in. Bad news, you're scrubbing off speed, you're damaging the front tyres, and you have to wait a long time to get on the power. We've intentionally set this Jordan up to understeer, turning into Priory here. Look, I've got a lot of steering lug on. The car won't get where I want it to. I'm beginning to run wide again. That damages the front tyres, and you cannot carry speed through the corner. Over several laps, of course, the more you damage those tyres, the more it understeers. It's a snowball effect. Let's see what it means in race conditions. Fisichella turns in, he's got enough steering lock on now, and has to crank another quarter of a turn on the steering wheel to get around the corner, pushing the tyre sideways down the road momentarily. There are two main ways to reduce understeer. Aerodynamically, lower the car a little bit to pick up downforce, or just simply add angle of attack to the front wing generating more aerodynamic downforce. Track conditions can vary during the race. Watch the Jordan mechanics alter the front wing of Damon's car to change the balance accordingly. Alternatively, you can soften the front suspension to pick up mechanical grip, springs and shock absorbers especially. Anything to give the front tyres more grip, or you can do the opposite and give the rear tyres less grip. Changes are small, a few percent stiffer or softer on the suspension, a millimetre or two on the ride height. Then you have oversteer, which is on the exit of the corner normally, generated by throttle movement more often than not. Again, let me put you where I am behind the wheel. You're going through a right-hand corner, you get on the power too early, and though you're still turning right, you end up putting left-hand steering lock in. The car is turning from the back, it's oversteered through the corner, and you have to steer out and correct it. Now we've set the Jordan up to oversteer. That means the back end's going to be too lively. I've got to be careful on the throttle. If I get on the throttle too early, the back is going to slide. I have to correct, correct immediately. And as soon as you have to lift the throttle, you've lost time. Understeer and oversteer can occur on the way into a corner, through the apex and on the exit. Let's watch Pedro Denitz now turning into this left-hander and almost immediately having to put right-hand lock in. That is serious turn-in oversteer, then mild understeer through the apex. So what can you do to fix the oversteer? Well, the first thing you can do is try and drive more smoothly, be more progressive on the throttle. But if that doesn't work, you've got to start adding rear downforce putting elements into the rear wing, into the cascade, giving you more downforce, pushing those rear tyres down. Or, for more mechanical grip, soften the rear end a little bit, spring, shock absorbers, anti-roll bar. Or, conversely, you can give the front end less grip, that can also help the rear. In any event, if you hit the sweet spot on the balance, you'll get a lot more confidence. You take more speed into the corners, and your lap time starts tumbling. Let's enjoy a beautifully balanced car. Hakkinen, McLaren, Spa. Heavy braking into the bus stop, totally stable. Turns in crisply, over the kerbs nicely. No wheel spin on the exit, no understeer, no oversteer. Direction change, good. The car is perfect. Hakkinen is very happy. Formula One cars will spin off for many reasons, and here's a few of them. Punctures, suspension failure, rear wing collapsing, or simply the driver trying too hard. Well, let's all admit it, we actually enjoy watching the cars spin off the racetrack. Why does that happen? Well, there's two ways you can spin a Formula One car. The first is on the way in. You arrive too fast, too deep, too late on the brakes, and you go flying off the road. Well, we've set the Jordan up to be a little bit tail happy as we go into this right-hander, just to demonstrate how easy it is to spin. I've got on the brakes too late, the back end of the car's come round, and there's nothing I can do about it. As soon as the pendulum swings, you're going round. Watch the Minardi driver arrive too late, on the brake still as he's turning in, and he's facing the wrong direction. Villeneuve in the BAR at higher speed doing exactly the same thing. Ralph Schumacher trying to outbreak up the inside on the dirty line and again he couldn't hold the bag. Now let's watch this Jordan another time. Right hander ahead of us but I'm too late on the brakes now and it just spins round. Very little warning when that happens. Let's see that from on board behind the steering wheel. 
And again, I'm going to break too late, but usually it's as you downshift, it just finishes it off. There's just not enough grip on the rear tyres, and round she goes. I managed to grab a handful of clutch, so I'm still in the race. I'll turn the car around and carry on. <laughs> so assuming you made it into the corner, you've still got to get through the exit. You've got a fantastic amount of power underneath your right foot, but you have to be careful with it. If you abuse it, <laughs> Tweak it a little bit too early and you'll find your engine overtaking you as you're pointing the wrong way down the racetrack and your competitors sailing past. And Rubens Barrichello, of course, knows as well as does Mika Hacken and what, it, what the Finn is going to try. And he tries try, right up behind Rubens Barrichello. Oh, he's going to spin, he caught, 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 caught the white line on the inside. Mika Hacken has shot himself well and truly in both feet. Well, that looked good fun. Let me have a go, Mika. Eddie Jordan's not watching. The tail end stepping out already. Now I'm going to get on the throttle. And the car spins round amazingly quickly. But as soon as it starts turning, your focus goes to getting it lined up, ready to continue down the racetrack. Well, I did that for you all by myself, with the track to myself. But imagine if you're wheel-to-wheel -wheel with another car, or it's wet, or there's gravel or oil on the track, it becomes even more easier to do that. But you know, you've got to spin from time to time, otherwise your mechanics think you're not trying hard enough. A little bit of fun for me at the end of the day, before we put the car away, just enjoying the power of a Formula One car. Our thanks to the Jordan team, and I hope this series of Formula One Driving School has given you a greater insight into the world of the Grand Prix driver. A fascinating insight there into what it really takes to drive a Formula One car properly. But right now, a world champion. What does he do at the end of his championship year? Well, in Mika Hakkinen's case, he takes in a little bit of culture. He goes on his victory tour to Eastern Europe. Grand Prix racing, your life is most of the time extremely intensive traveling. Not only go to the Grand Prix, but also testings, promotions. You are very rarely home, so it's really fantastic to have opportunity to have a wife to, to follow you and, and be with you. She comes to every Grand Prix, extremely good, she's supporting, extremely nice, she's present. Today I had the opportunity to come here with the maximum sunshine, so it's a, it's a great experience. It looks really beautiful, you know. And, um, I don't and, think and this is unique. I mean, nowhere else in the world you have something like this. I would have to do that myself. I would have missed the match already. <laughs> 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 I would have missed it already. You know? <laughs> Interesting, you know. I wish I could. I wish I could play this every well, not every day, but every every second, every third day, and just to play and practice. And you know, I think this is a fantastic game. And and young people, you know, I always say motor racing is not not a bad idea. I think it's a great hobby for the family, uh, for the kids. Ice hockey is the same thing. You know, it's a fabulous sport. It's good. You know, I enjoy it extremely. Ice skating was great today. Uh, you know, Slovenia was good, reception was great from the people, they were very happy, you know, meeting a mayor uh, in Praha, that was great meeting also, really good fun, you know, I think generally has been great. Okay. I feel good, it's the work is continuing, the life continues. 
soon we are already next year and uh, and this year's history so that's it basically There's a new team in Formula One this year, but it's a famous old name. The cat is back. Here now, the story of Jaguar's return to racing. Not in sports cars this time, but in Grand Prix. On the 30th of August, 1949, the first stock car race to be held in Great Britain was run on the Grand Prix circuit at Silverstone, where Mr. Lyons of the Jaguar Company has left his place in the spectator stand to chat with the drivers and wish them good luck. For a decade or more during the post-war years, the name Jaguar dominated the world of sports car racing, notching up numerous wins at endurance events, including five victories at the famous Le Mans 24 Hours. But by the end of the 50s, and with all his competitive ambitions fulfilled, Jaguar boss Sir William Lyons decided to quit racing and focus instead on the production of road cars. So William, there's the knockouts painting of the C-Type, the first car to win Le Mans at 100 miles an hour. When shall we see Jaguar going racing again? You can rest assured that um, we have this well in mind. We, uh, we are watching the developments of racing and we believe we could uh, get back into the ring any time we feel it's necessary. But three decades were to pass before the Jaguar team raced again. And as the 20th century drew to a close, they had yet to take on the ultimate challenge of Formula One. At the Frankfurt Motor Show, journalists from all over the world gather to review the latest in driver technology. This year, the floor is buzzing with rumors that the present chairman of Jaguar, Dr. Wolfgang Reitzler, is about to make an important announcement. Formula One is, of course, at the pinnacle of world motorsport. It is the ultimate test of competitiveness in terms of technology and progressive engineering expertise. Jaguar, for the first time in its history, will from now on compete in the Formula One World Championship. The world of Formula One is a tough place to be for a new team, and much has changed since the glories of Le Mans half a century ago. Jaguar Racing face some tough challenges in the months ahead, before they even make it to the starting line. Jaguar's first move on the slippery chessboard of Formula One has been to acquire the racing team founded by Jackie Stewart and his son Paul. Although the new season is still five months away, time has already become a precious commodity. Um, well, I think you'll f we, we've got to get this sorted out in, in the next, you know, very short time. Now 60 years of age, Stewart has a lifetime of motor racing experience to offer Jaguar but success for Formula One's newest arrivals will depend on much more than the legacy of one man. There's no substitute for teamwork. Nobody's going to do anything on their own. You've got to depend on good people. Gary Anderson's our technical director, big man, powerful man, strong opinions, and a good leader. Yeah, but you still get that, don't you? You just cut down into a radius. Then, yeah, it'll drop, it'll drop yeah. back a bit like a McLaren does. Yeah. I think everybody contributes towards the, um, the end result, don't they? I mean, there's, there's always little bits coming out, there's always little bits found, there's always solutions that somebody else has found a solution to. Um, it's like all these guys here, you know, that uh, any one of them would do things differently, and there really is only one correct solution. The one that was always said to Q was that, see this point here, see if you can see this, see this point here. 
there's a big there's a 20 degree chamfer that chamfers down to the single skin thickness there so it goes from the 8 mil section chamfers down at 20 degrees to the 2 mil section you're trying to develop the car during the year as well so it's never never ever a 95 by any means for anybody and for me I've got to try to get my head around what tomorrow's problems will be more than what's in front of you today. The clinical environment of the carbon fibre workshop is where Anderson's new design will begin to be realised. Thousands of man hours are required to build each car and total accuracy is vital. The failure of just one tiny component could decide the race. It takes like uh, three or four weeks to get a car, one car. I mean, how many cars do we do by February? This year we'll probably have five cars ready five by cars. February. But we're building maybe eight cars. So when you smash one, back to spare one again. When the season gets underway in March, race director Andy Miller will play a key role, overseeing team tactics and providing a crucial link between driver and machine. His main concern right now, though, is to get the new car ready as soon as possible. It never stops. Uh, the first deadline is usually the shakedown. You, you put a sort of line in the sand and say, right, by that date we want to have a car running on the circuit. And the design office is flat out until uh, Christmas, really, doing the new designs and developments. September, October, but then in October through, it's just flat out, just trying to get everything built in time. We're struggling to get things done for the 1st of January. It could be like, say, the 6th of January when all the signs go up. Okay. For the 13th of December meeting, do you need anything, any input from us on I don't think more so. specific things? If he asks you anything. Hello, how are you? Sorry for the delay upstairs, but we um, ran into quite a lot of trouble today. Paul, Neil and I have been consumed by that since this morning. Okay. So excuse us. All right, no problem. All right, have fun. <laughs> we always do. <laughs> they all have big responsibilities under them, and the very nature of Formula One is it's quite an explosive sport, business, and there's always issues that are coming up that need to be resolved, and they need to be resolved yesterday type of thing, because it's, um, it's so fast-moving. We've got at some time, and I don't know when you're going to do this, whether it's today or another day, but Neil and I have to have a conversation that carried over from Detroit, and I don't know whether you've got that piece of paper that you write. So the only thing I could do is, is just ask Rob to, 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 to kick off on the, on, the, on the working group meeting. Well, it, even if it's a matter of a few minutes, Paul, what we about? have to discuss is quite important. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. secondly, you've got to discuss these other issues that you and I briefly touched on, and I think that's something we can't do on camera. He's probably one of the most demanding men I've ever met. He's, uh, he's very intense, he's very hard on everybody, and he, he, he expects a lot. And I think that's just obviously being, being a driver himself, and he expected a lot from himself, so he expects a lot from other people. Far away from the growing tensions at the factory, driver Johnny Herbert relaxes in the sunny tranquility of Monaco, where he now lives. The time he spends here provides welcome relief from the never-ending routine of travelling, testing and racing. It's nice to, to get away from it all. It's nice to get away from the pressure, get your thoughts together. Um, being a family man, obviously, it's probably very important for me, obviously, to try and get with... Uh, with my two daughters who don't see me very often, uh, so I've got to try and get there as, as much as I can. There's probably a little bit of work before Christmas, and then it really, really starts in earnest in, uh, in January, so uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very long year. Johnny's new teammate is a different kind of beast altogether. Arriving fresh from Ferrari, Eddie Irvine was runner-up in last year's championship. Controversial, outspoken, and not just fast in a racing car. Thank you for your remarks last night. Were you still there when I said that you were better at taking trousers off than putting them on? No one had left. Uh, I thought I you had. had. a spy there. Yeah. I had a spy. <laughs> that got a good laugh. That got a good laugh. <laughs> Eddie Irvine, he's very radical. He speaks his mind. Sometimes some would say outspoken. But I like that, and I think Jaguar need that. You know, I, I live my life the way I, I like to live it, um, and I don't 
you know, someone asked me where I was last night and I was in a nightclub, I'll say I was in a nightclub, you know, a lot of drivers will say they were in bed at 10 o'clock when they were actually probably lying under some, you know, car, drunk as a skunk somewhere. Well, anyway, Neil you'll see a lot of and he's your man to have a good relationship with. Um, you got your fitting? Yeah, you just need to do the, these, um, what we do them down there, mm -hmm. just airbags. Yeah. Proportionally, haven't you got a longer body yeah. than oh, you yeah, have yeah. legs? So, in fact, the legs are which would normally be a, a more likely a problem. And in yeah. fact, when you were in the car there, I thought you were very low in the car. I thought it looked good. Today is Eddie's first indication of what Gary Anderson's brand new Jaguar will feel like. That's the steering wheel's actually quite hard. Because see, my my car, my bolt, I can't turn more than that because my hand has my bolts. He will, on occasions, have to be patient with certain things um, because he's come coming from a team which, no doubt, had a much bigger budget uh, and has been contending for the World Championship for... well, has been contending, which we have never contended for the World Championship yet. So he needs to be patient with that and assist us as much as we can help him. But with a facility crammed with computers and carbon fibre, Jaguar has certainly come a long way since its humble beginnings in Blackpool, Lancashire. It was here in September 1922 that a young motorcycle enthusiast by the name of William Lyons borrowed a few hundred pounds and with his partner, William Wormsley, started the Swallow Sidecar Company. From this small workshop, a variety of sidecars were built to suit the various makes of motorcycle that were around at the time. Their expertise in vehicle coachwork then led to a lucrative contract producing the Austin Swallow, and it wasn't long before they were forced to vacate their humble facility and move to a larger plant in Coventry. By the 30s, Lyons was employing over a thousand men, turning out cars with a style and grace that would come to define the era. The name Swallow Sidecars became abbreviated to SS, and it was an SS100 car that won the Alpine Rally in 1936, an indication of the kind of speed and reliability that would become a hallmark in later years. But the onset of World War II brought a halt to such grand designs, and the factory began contributing to the war effort by producing aircraft parts. Situated in one of the most bombed areas of Britain, the Coventry plant was lucky to survive the war. When peacetime finally returned to Britain, it was back to the usual business of car production, this time with one very significant difference. The name SS wasn't very popular, I don't think. Um, I asked our publicity people to let me have a list of um, animals, birds and so on, and um, I picked Jaguar out and thought it was very good, and uh, I never regretted it. And so the brand was born. By the end of the decade, car production was back in full flow and construction of their first high-performance sports car, the XK120, had begun. A glorious decade of racing lay just around the corner. Fifty years later, the Jaguar plant at Browns Lane still remains, but much has changed in over half a century. Many of the workers here share a passion for motor racing and the prospect of being part of the glamorous world of Formula One has been greeted with much enthusiasm. It's, it's nice to be back in that sort of... Nice to be back in the top bracket, yeah. Yeah, you sort of get a bit of pride and it's sort of news and there's... listening to radios and things. been away too long, but been away long enough, like, you know? Yeah, yeah. You need to be back there now. So it does, it boosts, it boosts everything, doesn't mm. it? Boosts the morale of the workforce. All the others that have been out there, and Jaguar hasn't been there, they're going to be shaking in the shoes, hopefully, right? You know, Jaguar's coming back with a big, big time now, you know. Teamwork. If you've got the right team, that's where you're going to hit it. You've got the right team, the right tools, 
right car, there's no reason why on this earth why we shouldn't be. The first model of what will become known as the R1 is beginning to take shape and the new team hope to be testing the car in a few weeks. For the time being, the colour of the car is similar to the British racing green of yesteryear. The chance of it remaining that way, however, is extremely unlikely. Formula One in the 21st century has become an exercise in corporate branding and the final choice of both colour and design will be the subject of much debate over the coming weeks. At Jaguar's design facility in Whitley, the creative team is striving to come up with a look which will make a big impression at racing circuits all over the world. It's important we can't let the sponsorship dominate the green car. On the other hand, we can't let our green car dominate the sponsors. We must make sure the sponsors are going to be happy with what we've got. And that's going to be a fine balance because there are a number of people in there, a number of companies in there that all have to be looked at. We would start off with British Racing Green, but ultimately we'd probably try and tune the colour so that it would be more applicable to the track and for photography in 1955 when the D-types were running at the Mans. A dark green car on a, on a black track looks pretty boring, even if you win the race. So it's probably important to take that colour and tune it so that it picks up on pho photographs, picks up on TV and looks good on film. Yeah, I think it's the easier option, but I think if we can get the paint to work, then I'd rather go down that way. Back at Milton Keynes, the pace is beginning to heat up. There is much more to prepare than just the car. Mm. We'll have the trucks in one, in one colour, we'll have the same colour used on the fuel bowsers and all that kind of equipment. And if possible, yeah, because I just think it'll keep the consistency then. I mean, obviously, the Formula One is driven by money and the sponsors involved, you know, there's a lot, it's a lot more high profile now than what it ever was. Um, we've got to make it look good in order to satisfy our sponsors, get over the messages that they want to you know, achieve. The sport has come a long way from the days when you simply applied a coat of green paint to your Jaguar and went motor racing. In, in those days, no advertising was allowed at all, and I mean none. The only advertising you'd see, funnily enough, is, is Pirelli or Dunlop on your overalls. That was, I think, about the only thing you'd see, nothing on the cars. The most prominent element of the racing car, in fact, was a big white circle with a big black number on it. Today, in our Formula One cars, the number is extremely small. I mean, the number's only about this size. Um, the number doesn't pay anything. Nineteen fifty one saw the British Racing Drivers Club organise another top line meeting at Silverstone, driven by some of the star names of the British racing world, such as Sterling Moss. Now what you've got to realise is at that time it was, things were totally different. I mean totally different. First of all, you're talking about drivers mostly were amateur. I mean I happened to be professional, but I was very amateur professional. It's only a few minutes before starting time now, and the drivers are trooping away from the pits to listen to last-minute instructions, which will be given to them by the clerk of the course. In addition to a discourse on safe driving and gentlemanly conduct, they will be reminded of the meaning of the various flag signals. A yellow flag meant caution. Now, you be careful. It didn't say if you pass another guy, you're gonna, you know, it's going to cost you money or you're going to be out of it. I mean, it, it's difficult for me to understand what the hell they're doing now, in truth, because in those days, it, it was so much fun. It was so the way it should be. It was so right. These Jaguar XK drivers are a pretty fast bunch, but Sterling went steadily through the lot, and by the end of the fourth lap, he was out in the lead, never to be even remotely challenged for the rest of the race. With Sterling getting the checkered flag, the race comes to an end with another arresting success for the Jaguar. Fifty years later, the echoes of a bygone age still reverberate around a deserted and wintry Silverstone. But today is special. 
a little bit of history is about to repeat itself. Behind the garage doors, the all-new Jaguar racing team are hoping to give the R1 its first outing. The honour of this task will fall to the team's test driver, Luciano Berti. And so, 78 years after William Lyons made his first sidecar, a Formula One Jaguar takes to the track for the very first time. garage is about to change. The team are about to discover a problem that will lose them valuable testing time before the World Championship begins in March. Gary Anderson will have a few more grey hairs by then. Teams are always pushing to gain any possible advantage in Formula One and frequently have to take a step back in order to go forward. Uh, just so got this new this new system that we've trying for the first time, and it's uh, it's causing us some problems. Uh, we'd like to do more running, but this is what a shakedown's about. But uh, sometimes difficult to to um, to pick out the iron out the problems when you run the car for the first time. Everyone involved expects nothing less than a world-beating car. The only way to get one will be to work even harder. It will no doubt be a tall order for the new team to come even close to matching Jaguar's past achievements. Le Mans, for nearly half a century, this attractive town, as typically French as the gendarme, has been famous as the centre of motorsport. Today, the 24-hour race is the most important sports car event in the world. Always, really. I mean, Le Mans has been a very important race, there's no doubt about it. Far more important, really, than it is the, it, to the manufacturer than it is to a driver, really. But the importance of winning is enormous. 30 seconds to go, and the crowd is stilled. The flag falls, and the Sterling sprints across to his car. The unbearable tension subsides in the sound and fury of the Le Mans star. Le Mans in the, uh, in the 50s was uh, classified as possibly the, one of the premier top races. It was the top race, I would put it, uh, in the world. Because uh, there was nowhere else where they were doing a 24-hour endurance on that type of um, uh, running. Jaguar and Le Mans were destined for each other. At its first outing in 1950, the XK120 ran well, but ultimately missed out on a top spot on the podium. But victory would not be long in coming. Just one year later, and using a modified version of the car, now known as the C-Type, the driving partnership of Walker and Whitehead came home ahead of the pack to give Jaguar its first win. The Big Cats won again in 1953, when the C-Type became the first car ever to use disc brakes. A standard item now, but back then a revolutionary innovation. The motor racing world was beginning to sit up and take notice. This is a time to celebrate, to drink to the glories of the past, the successes of the present and the achievements of the future. When you'd finished 24 hours, if you were successful and were first over the line, it was a great victory because you'd beat the world, you know. Scrutineering is almost over. The crowds disperse again to the cafe for cognac and conversation on how formidable are the new Chaguar. By 1955, Sterling Moss had defected to Mercedes and together with the legendary driver Juan Fangio would become a tough combination to beat. But Jaguar were back with the formidable D-Type along with some new faces, including a tall, dashing blonde by the name of Mike Hawthorne. Oh, Mike, he was a great character. Uh, very debonair and uh, he took it very lightly. Um, 
a lot of drivers, if, uh, if, we, if we look at Sterling Moss, very serious contender for motor racing, kept himself fit and he took it very seriously. Mike took it very sort of happy-go-lucky. He was a great character and, and we actually got along quite well but people didn't think we did because he's a blonde and he drank beer and he's tall and I'm small and got no hair virtually and and you know I, I was teetotaler and they felt well we were different and either you're a Hawthorne fan or a Moss fan. Apart from Sterling Moss I would put Mike Hawthorne as the best probably one of the best drivers we had uh, because as I say he was phenomenal on the day nobody could uh, stand against him. <laughs> Mercedes air brakes rising and falling almost in unison. Behind them, Hawthorne and Fangio prepare to lap them. The 50s were a time when motor racing safety was a far cry from the rigorous standards of today. Drivers frequently diced with danger as they tore along the straights at speeds of well over 160 miles an hour. Yes, it was dangerous, but to me, part of the thrill is because I'm risking my life. And you're going down the straight, and in the jag, you're going pretty quickly, particularly in the later years. The guy's in there really thinking, my God, I'm going like the clappers of hell. At Arnage, Hawthorne is on Levesque's tail with Fangio momentarily balked. The crowd is watching the rapid pit stops. Mars is busy with a stopwatch. All is normal. The race runs its appointed course. What came next would be a catastrophe on a scale never previously seen at a motor racing event. The next Mercedes hurtles onto the parapet. Macklin's Austin Healy smacks headlong into the retaining wall as a tyre spins and subsides, silent and grotesque in this moment of disaster. A burst of flame and smoke rises high above the stand. Pierre Levesque of the Mercedes team was dead, along with 81 of the crowd, who perished as his car plunged into the packed grandstand. It was a disastrous accident, and I, I can remember so well that really being pulled virtually back into the pits by people leaping up and jumping off, off the, the few that were in the track, and uh, seeing, of course, a lot of mess, really. But rightly, the race goes on. Ivor Bueb looks down on the car he is to drive. New to the team, his thoughts at this time can only be imagined. Ivor Bueb, who was, who was a partner in uh, Hawthorne, it was his first Limon. And I, I remember now, he stood there and he said, Norman, I'm not going out on this. He said, look at it. He said, this is, this is crazy. And I said, Ivor, you, you've got to drive, the race hasn't stopped. So when Mike comes in, you, you've got to take over. He faces a duel with Moss on the Mercedes. What guts to get into a car at such a moment, but he does. When Mercedes learned they had lost one of their drivers, they withdrew from the race, leaving Hawthorne and Bueb in their D-type to pick off the rest of the field. No other team would come close. And there goes the winner, number six, Jaguar. Hawthorne tours slowly back to the pit and the applause that is the winner's due. The win was Jaguar's third in five years, but because of the tragic events earlier, the taste of champagne would be bittersweet. Three years later, Hawthorne would become Britain's first ever Formula One world champion, only to lose his life in a road accident before the decade was over. Jaguar had by now become the dominant force at Le Mans. The factory's experience of building aircraft during the war had taught them a useful lesson in aerodynamics, and the D-type's sleek design owed much to this knowledge. It won again in 1956 and 57, pulling off a hat-trick of victories at Le Mans, their fifth in seven years. Privately entered Jaguars, first, second, third, fourth and sixth, in a race few expected them to do well in. That win marked the end of a golden chapter in Jaguar's racing history. For the time being, William Lyons felt there was little left to prove on the racetrack and was keen to concentrate on the business of producing road cars. It would be three decades before a Jaguar won again at Le Mans. In 
1988, the XJR9 proved to be a competitive and reliable car, and by the time the 24 hours were up, it had won the hearts of the crowd as well as the race. Two years later, they won again. It was Jaguar's seventh Le Mans triumph. The big cats were enjoying a second purple patch around this time, leaving the opposition green with envy. Back in Coventry, green is very much on the agenda for the Jaguar creatives. It's decision time for the final choice of the car's colour. That's quite dramatic. That's interesting. Yeah, it's too dark though, isn't it? That's too dark, and this is probably too creamy. We we'll probably have to go to a much stronger white than the cream. It's quite interesting, the cream, but I think we need something that's much punchier. So if we can get the white coming out of the brighter green, see what that looks like. See, that, that's a strong green down at the bottom right now, but I don't know what the hell it would be like in a dull day on a starting grid on a black piece of road. Well, then you'll be relying on the white. <laughs> yeah. That's what you see, but it needed white the whole time. It I needed something absolutely. like this from the beginning. Absolutely. I think we're at the point now where we've been through all the iterations and we've kind of got to yeah. hit it, and yeah. I think, you know, we're... We're, um, well, we know the blue one doesn't work. Yeah, we've, we've excluded that. Excluded okay. that. So it's really a question of this. And this. And this is slightly for dark, for that. darker version. The reason Ian chose that is it's this. darker and it hasn't got as many yellow yeah. flips. I would take and Ian's choice. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The Jaguar thing, the spirit of Jaguar, and the whole business about it, I think is just going to be the best thing that we could have had for this next generation. Had we carried on as we were, I think we would have done all right. But I don't really think we would have done as well as we all wanted to do. And most of you have come here to win. Jaguar Racing. He's not here today. Can anybody else help you? Thank you very much. Bye bye. With the big launch now just days away, every last detail is being checked. Nothing must go wrong and nothing must look out of place. Not even Eddie Irvine's shoes. Uh, can you tile these, Eddie? Yeah, well, he's going to be able to tile them better than me, so I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's dead on. Huh? Is that all right? Yeah, that's the Okay. For two, two pairs for you. Right. That's that one. Knowing that you're delinquent drivers is always a problem. No, he's, what I do is we leave this stuff in the truck so that I don't have to bring it to the races. It's always there. Oh, yeah, once you get to Europe. Yeah, yeah. But no good for Brazil or Argentina yeah. or, or, uh, or Australia. Okay. Jack Nasser, the president of Jaguar's parent, the Ford Motor Company takes a keen business and personal interest in the racing team and visits the factory to check on progress. The programme's actually well paced for the beginning of the season. I mean, and we have been competitive uh, on times. We, we think the chassis is good, the engine's coming along well, we've got little glitches at the moment, but 
you know, we're fairly confident about that. But on the oh, other no, hand, we're about double, right? Yeah. Well, it's more than double, not nearly good. Well, we had like we've been present at the test, but we just haven't been able to complete the mileage. So it's been a bit of a dent to the program from that point of view. We have, including today, four more days of running plus a possible run at Silverstone. Um, so we're really, uh, we're really hoping that we're going to be able to get back on track. A, a smooth track as well. Yeah. If you took you around you the Jerez when it starts, or Monaco when they're hitting curves, it's a whole lot more violent than that. Mm. See what you mean now about the suspension movement. Yeah, I mean that's maximum suspension movement. Now is that Eddie or Johnny? Uh, <laughs> I think that's one of Eddie's girlfriends actually. Go faster, socks by Jackie Stewart. Hello, Adrian. Yeah, fine. Yeah. It's now just one day before the launch. Time for a few final adjustments before representatives of the world's media catch their first glimpse of the new car. Months of effort are about to reach a climax. OK, good. So it's, it's clearly recognised. That, I think, is the only element of a cue that I have to concern myself with. And then I'm going to just go in to the elements of that. Yeah. After this picture Jaguar's chairman, Dr. Wolfgang Reitzler, has flown in to launch the car. Reputations are at stake, and he's determined to take a hands-on role in motivating the drivers to deliver. But we are as quick as last year's McLaren. Maybe a little bit faster, a little bit. But they will have... Wolfgang does seem to be very, very excited about the prospect of, uh, of Jaguar being in Formula One and being successful. And I think the, the, the whole thing that's, that's looking very, very good and very encouraging is, is the commitment that everybody's putting in. Did you, did you see something? No, we haven't seen the Jordan yet, no. It ran one I mean, day. I, I want to, I, I tell you what, Next I want to beat day. Jordan. I mean, this can't be. No, we've got to beat McLaren. Jordan, yeah, is one. But we, need to beat, we need to be a McLaren. I want to be number three next year. That would be. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Number three next year would be a good time. A good start. Mm. Ferrari yeah. number one. I would like that. McLaren two and we three. That would be a good start, no? And then we attack. It'd, it'd be a good start. And then absolutely. we go aggressive. Yes, 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 absolutely. No, no, no. Launch day has arrived. The media scramble is about to begin and will continue for hours. The entire motor racing world wants to know about the new car, the new engine, the new drivers. In this sport, hype is just as important as horsepower. Um, by next year, certainly, and maybe even uh, doing better than people might expect this year. Obviously, I'm sure that they'll give him the right level of support that uh, will allow him to, uh, to, to learn a great deal and to be... We're trying to develop the car during the year as well. It's a new car now, but... Et aussi à Sébastien. Alors, euh, je suis confiant qu'on sera bien prêt pour euh, la première course de l'an 2000 à Melbourne. I hope we can live up to it. That's the main thing. Um, big expectations. Small team and a big expectations. That's the, that's really what worries me. I, everyone thinks, you know, people that don't understand from one thing, we're just going to come in and boom, we're here, guys. You know, follow us. As the interviews draw to a close, one of the biggest stories of the day is about to be broken by Jackie Stewart. Today, I'm going to announce that I'm going to retire as chairman and chief executive officer of our team. I need to move over and allow the people who are really doing the job to be given the space to do so. I'm not going away. I will attend most of the Grand Prix races and I'll still be at the testing and still very much involved in the team, but not with the same number of hours. Neil Ressler, the man who will fill Jackie's shoes, now moves into the spotlight. As the new chairman of Jaguar Racing, my job obviously is to ensure that we have a competitive race team. The new car shows a lot of promise and both Eddie and Johnny believe it has a lot of potential for the new season. In some ways, there's an emotion that it's, it, 
it's uh, the, the partnership will now evolve into a different dimension, and um, uh, a, a tinge of sadness that it, it won't be the same. But you know, life moves on, and in this case, life has moved on very well uh, for all concerned. I believe. Tomorrow's papers will carry the news that the big cats are back. But for Formula One's newest racing team, the new season is just around the corner, and the hard work is only just beginning. Back at Silverstone, Eddie Irvine gets ready to put some more miles on the R1. Only constant testing can provide the team with enough information to make the new car fully competitive, and there is much to learn in a short space of time. I can blast into the corner and get all the way to the apex without having to pick up the throttle again because it's or, yeah, yeah. you know waiting, 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 waiting okay, on the well, throttle and then having to pick up the throttle. The first thing we do then is just come down to front and rear and just see. Installation that's in there, but um, I actually want to pass the pits. And uh, this has got a different clutch characteristic, so just be expect something a little bit different. <laughs> I tell you what, your steering is amazing. How much better it is than the Ferrari steering straight away. <laughs> Whatever we did with the power steering, <laughs> we you get worked for, never we're to try and get better on the power steering, we're worse on the clutch. You know, like we worked forever trying to get this power steering so that it, you felt the, it. it was, you were really in control of the car and there was always a little bit of a flick on the turn in. You never really got rid of that. at the beginning of the, the you know because it's a, it's a raw track and everybody seems to go out there and all the unlikely guys seem to go fast early which is what usually happens Best fuel. for the overdrive too no 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 because if you bring in you can go out there and suddenly see an arrow in the top three because mm. the, the, the young guy or whoever he is is driving his ass off in order to get a decent time. The more mature guys are saying the track's dirty. I like the mature bit. I don't like older. Don't use the word older. <laughs> experience. experience. Well experienced. Yeah. But if you suddenly get people slipping in banana skins, you know. You've got to be the next one there. Exactly. And you might luck out a couple of times, but the point is you're lucking out when they're. You need less people in front of you. Absolutely. So you luck in. Absolutely. The fewer people there, the That's better. right.
your pride is out there every Sunday afternoon for the world to see and uh, it, you know if you don't do a good job for whatever reason it, it hurts and um, that's what pushes you so hard because you know you you want to walk around the next days with your head held high and if you've if you've screwed up it, it's you have another two weeks to wait before you can reprieve yourself <laughs> But for Jaguar Racing, time has finally run out. Ready or not, the team must now pack up and go to Melbourne, Australia for its first ever Formula One race. So you always get to the beginning of the season saying, Crikey, I wish we had more time to do this and this and this. But if you were given that time, you'd still be in the same position because you'd still be trying to push the limits. And again, it's what Formula One's about. You're always challenging the limits. You just never stop pushing forward. It's not the Olympic spirit alone which uh, takes us to the uh, Formula One challenge. Uh, it's not participating only and making a nice impression. We want to finally win. I just don't really know how good uh, Eddie and Johnny are going to be. Um, it's too early to say, really. But if, if, if they, if they, I think that they should be up there. It's going to be great if we can get a good result. That's what it's going to be about. The results, everything. You know, all this goes before, during, and after. It doesn't really matter. It's the result that counts. And if we have a great result, then I'll be happy. As a British driver at the British Grand Prix and with the British fans in, uh, in a name like Jaguar, uh, I think it's going to be a, a very special, special moment. Jaguar are just arriving when those people have learned as many lessons, I think, in the time that they could have done and are now more able to take on what I would call the big time. They can handle it. there of Jaguar's success over the years but only time will tell how they will fare in Grand Prix racing in the future but now let's find out how they and the rest of the teams got on in qualifying today at Silverstone as we cross to the pit lane and James Allen well Tony this was one of the most thrilling qualifying sessions we've seen for many many years because as you know it's been raining throughout the weekend here at Silverstone the Friday practice session and the Saturday morning practice sessions so really it was a wet track that was drying throughout the qualifying hour and that always brings out the best action in Formula One very very exciting right up to the final moments of qualifying the pole time dropped steadily as the track dried up the racing line. First of all, it was Jacques Villeneuve, then it was Michael Schumacher. David Coulthard took provisional pole position. Mika Hakkinen took provisional pole position. And as the clock ticked down, Villeneuve popped back in again. All the teams had saved up a few laps in the bank for the final five minutes of qualifying. They all went out at the same time. And amazingly enough, it was Rubens Barrichello who took the pole position. He's done it before, of course, in Belgium a couple of years ago and last year in France on a drying track in the Ferrari this time. First Ferrari pole position here at Silverstone since Nigel Mansell did it back in 1990. But the other big story was the guy behind me here, his car being prepared by the Jordan mechanics this evening. That's Heinz Harold Frentzen coming on second place on the grid. Now, I just remember last year in France, of course, he won that very wet race at Manucourt. Frentzen, a major threat. But the other big story of the day was Jensen Button. Once again, out qualifying his teammate Ralph Schumacher in the BMW Williams team. Jensen sixth on the grid alongside Michael Schumacher, who, of course, for many years has been his hero. And so the grid, Rubens Barrichello, his third career pole position and his first for Ferrari, alongside him, Heinz Harold Frentzen. Row two, Mika Hakkinen, who really needs the full 10 points tomorrow, and David Coulthard, his teammate, his job to keep Schumacher behind him. Row three, Michael Schumacher, the man to watch, and alongside him, Jensen Button. 
row four. Ralph Schumacher, another great effort from the new BMW team. Alongside him, Jos Verstappen finally gets the arrows into the top ten. Row five, Eddie Irvine in the Jaguar could have been so much better. And Jacques Villeneuve alongside, same story. Row six, Trulli and Fisichella. Row seven, Diniz and Herbert, who lost out again. Row eight, Alessi and Zonta. Row nine, Nick Heidfeld in the Pros Peugeot, alongside Mika Salo. Row ten, De La Rosa and Alex Wurtz, and what has gone wrong with him. And row 11, Janay and Matt Sakani. So they're just firing up the engines here for the final time this evening. The mechanics working very, very hard indeed on all of the cars. Will it be wet tomorrow? Will it be dry? Who knows? But one thing's for sure, it's going to be a thrilling British Grand Prix. Thank you, James. And don't forget that you can watch the Grand Prix from Silverstone live on ITV tomorrow afternoon. Now, it's just about time for me to turn in. The embers are dying away here. I'm going to head up for my bed shortly, but not before we all have a bit of a laugh. We've all enjoyed Martin Brundle's famous grid walks. Well, we've put a series of them together, which you can enjoy now. But don't forget, they're live. He has no idea who he's going to meet or what they're going to say to him. Enjoy them, and good night. There's something been curious about this broadcast. Sylvester, uh -oh. can we have a, have a word? What's yeah, uh, on, my good side. on your good side? Yeah, you did tell me it's going to be your right hand side. What's special about it? That one didn't get hit quite as many times? Yeah, okay. I don't know whether anybody will talk to me. I'll give it a try. If I was them, I wouldn't, I have to tell you now. But anyway, let's give it a try. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, Mika. Mika. Hello, Mika. Are you interested to talk to me today? No. <laughs> okay, good. So we'll carry on then. Michael. Michael. Uh, okay, BSF have beat me to it. Okay, no, they haven't. I think we've just uh, pulled a bit of a fast one here. We're going to uh, first probably do all the preliminary shooting around the world at, at many of the races and then choose a track where we do the special stunts, most likely in Hungary or Montreal. Good stuff. Who plays Murray Walker in this, uh, in this uh, film? Robert Redford, I believe. Here's Bernie Ecclestone, look. Bernie, how are you doing? Uh, I'm not fighting him. Uh, right, well, he's, he's, my, he's my minder today because... because uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Uh, he's my minder today, Bernie, because I hear you tried to steal my job in Imola. Why is that? Well, I thought somebody should do it the way you do things. <laughs> All right, so uh, will you leave my headset alone? Because I need to listen to these people. You don't know what they're talking so, about anyway. Who's going to win the World Championship? Um, the one with the most points, I'm sure. I don't know who it's going to be, though, at the moment. All right, thank you for that valid contribution. <laughs> I knew you couldn't work it out. No, I couldn't. That's why I asked you. See you later. <laughs> I've written a script, right? Edge Frentzen into the gravel, into the first corner. Drill Irvine. Yeah. Uh, Schumacher and Hacken are going to have each other off. Follow Coulthard. He's going to come in 10 laps to go because he's going to be so surprised the car's still running. Yeah. You go on to win. Yellow flag's waving. Yeah. How about that? I think you should drive and I'll do the commentary. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have to think about training, diet, uh, working for the sponsors, uh, and, and, and all... Uh, we just found a we just found a prize for a, for a, yeah, we just found a prize for a competition sometime later this year. I'll end the cap for a while. No, you can have it. No, no, I, I need it. I need it. More. You can keep it. No, no, no. But I want this particular one look, from the Monza grid. Damon Hill, Grecian 2000, and uh, you know dandruff and everything. Naomi Campbell. Excuse me, uh, dare I touch her on the back? I can't, what do I do? How do I do this, Keith? Do I just sort of... I don't want to be accused of... Uh, Naomi, would you have a, it's good to see you here in the Grand Prix. Naomi Campbell, uh, what are you doing here? I came to watch. Keep enjoying yourself down there, Martin. Strong journalistic bent to all his interviews, isn't it? <laughs> Let's have a word with Elizabeth Hurley. She's here on the grid. Let's uh, see if I can... Can you follow me, Keith? Elizabeth Hurley, hello. Hello. You're, in, you're soaking up the atmosphere. Are you a Grand Prix fan? I never have been before. This is my first time, and now I'm going to become a groupie. Yeah, well, what do you like most about it? Actually, the boys are pretty cute. I can't <laughs> believe some of the ones I've just been introduced to. It's all very exciting. So the technology and the speed at the moment hasn't impressed you as much as the boys? I haven't really seen any speed yet. I'm looking forward to that. We're going up to the first corner as for the takeoff, or whatever they call it here. That it's called the start. What is all this about Brands Hatch? I hear you've sort of done a little bit of a deal with Brands Hatch for the Grand Prix. Did you get have a go there? 
Um, there or Silverstone for sure. Lira, well, that's I, I love it because you're always so absolutely. You never sit on the fence, do you? You've got to be solid. You've got to. We all know where we stand. Which is fastest, the Ferrari or the McLaren? Ferrari seems to have a one-lap pace, but the McLaren are on the front row of the grid. My tip at the moment is the piano sitting here at the front of the grid. I've never seen that before. Mr. Prescott, any chance of having a quick word with us live on ITV? Uh, is this your first Grand Prix? No, no, I've been three or four times, but uh, what a wonderful day. What a wonderful event, and I'm giving the prize, so that's a great privilege. Best driver to win, but I'm hoping it's Damien. <laughs> Sorry, who are you looking for? You're looking for Damien. Damien, yes. All right. What do you think of today's Formula One drivers, really? Um, very conservative. In what way? In what way? No, uh, out of the car, I mean. They're very conservative. We're lacking a few characters like you. I mean, you was a bit wild and mad and outspoken and things, and they're not like that anymore. That is all.